gives me great pleasure to, to welcome you all here. Um, this is one of, another one of these wonderful events that happen, and I'm coming in to give a welcome, and I shouldn't be the person welcoming you. I'm going to turn the stage over, over to, uh, to my colleague, Danny Leipziger, in a few minutes to do that, because this is really his, uh, his program. I mean, he really came to us with the Growth Dialogue and actually had brought it to us, and it's such a wonderful opportunity um, to talk about important issues, the kinds of issues that we want to be the central conversation on, but also to really bring in, in top scholars. Now, uh, Nanny works on, on issues that are across the world, but of course, as, as all of you know, or it, uh, if you know me at all, you probably have gleaned that m the real issue of my own passion and my own intellectual life has been China. Uh, so I want to just take a couple of of minutes to talk about what my thoughts are on, on uh, the growth is issues with respect to China and the future of growth, uh, and then turn it over to our esteemed guest, because that's really, uh, he's really the, the, the feature here. Uh, it's been a really interesting year for China. Uh, it's been a very interesting couple of weeks, if you've been following the news. Um, I've been bullish on economic growth and development in China for over two decades. Uh, I was one of those people who was arguing with Jeffrey Sachs way back in the 80s that uh, actually China's gradualist and decentralized approach were really the right approach for how to develop an economy effectively. I mean, that was, those were the heady days of Big Bang and shock therapy. And uh, um, you know, there were a lot of people who weren't convinced. And they were convinced that if China is a good story, it's a good story in part because China has a very deep, cheap labor pool, and they can afford to do this. But at some point, this is going to run out. Now, I think today, in the post, the, a decade after China's accession to the WTO, um, we've seen a different story unfolding. And it's not just a story about China's growing power and flexing its muscle in the global economy. But in my view, it's a story that actually has, says interesting things about the capitalist model. Uh, and what economic development is really about. In the post-2008 era, I think it has even shaken that conversation up to a greater extent. Uh, it used to be the case when I would travel throughout China or give lectures on China on these issues, we'd talk about the interesting economic development story of China. And people would say, yeah, but still the hallowed industry of finance. We are still golden in this space. Right? And so the confidence has in some ways been shaken on that issue. And China's power has really grown dramatically, at least relative to us, uh, in that short time period. So after becoming a dean uh, and spending the last two years not just talking about economic development in China, but also trying to think about how it relates to the US economy and what it means for US policy, I've tried to think a little bit more about how all of the things I used to talk about that were made China so successful, how they related to the US situation. And so I think that there are actually interesting parallels there. And I'd just like to mention five things that I think really matter for the future of growth in China, but also the things that worry me about the United States. Those are gradualism, decentralization, foreign direct investment, cross-industry strategizing, uh, and and finally, uh, the, the, the issue that I think is probably most important is public-private partnerships. Okay? Each of these, I think, matter for as sort of the secret sauce of China's economic development. They're not radical ideas, but they are ideas that China has moved forward with very aggressively. And they're ideas that, because of the ideological breakdown in the United States system, we have gone further and further uh, away from. Now, it's very interesting, just as a footnote, uh, to, to note that the US economy used to be a lot more like this. In the mid part of the, of the 20th century, we were much more of an economy that embraced many of those kinds of ideas. So I think that this move away from it has been part of an ideological development that has been interesting and I think kind of throws some questions about what it is that we need to be thinking about economic development. First thing, gradualism. Gradualism, I think, has been a very important and powerful thing in China, not just because China has moved slowly through developmental processes, uh, and this is not just hindsight is 2020 at looking at shock therapy, but this is all, all actually that um, gradualism allows for experimentation. It allows for thinking about what new economic models might be. And it's a very different way of thinking about the economic system and how to roll out new policies. 
Um, and so I think that, that gradualism is a, it frustrates a lot of the international economy. We think that China is dragging its feet on all kinds of issues from political reform to uh, financial reform. Uh, but it is true that where some of that dragging of its feet issue is real, some of the issue of experimentation within the economy is also very real. And so I think it's really important to acknowledge how important gradualism is and what it actually does. Now, to me, the secret sauce of China's reforms, though, are, of course, decentralization. Decentralization is really important because it created local state economies and competition amongst those economies that really, really drove development. So you can have radical economic reform without privatization. The interesting thing for us is, though, I think as a comparative point, we have a broken federalist system in which we put too much stock in the federal government ourselves and don't realize that most of our own economic development is coming from states and municipalities, similar to the way China has mastered it over the course of its, its time as well. FDI is an obvious one for China. China has been so good at attracting foreign direct investment in order to learn from technology. Uh, we, interestingly, have a lot of our doors closed to the $3 trillion of foreign exchange reserves that China sits on. Probably not $3 trillion today, but it's still it's, you know, in the high, high twos. Um, and that's a lot of money that has been siphoned out because of globalization and needs to come back. And so we need a political process that actually really understands how to embrace those kinds of issues. The fourth issue, which I think is, is kind of one key to how an economy should be run, this cross-industry strategizing. Um, I think we have an idea today about governments engaged in economies as fundamentally inefficient, and a lot of state-owned organizations are. Uh, but governments also have industrial policy, and they also have things that actually make them really effective in thinking deeply about these issues. China, of course, has embraced that kind of idea. We have been moving away from it steadily. And the final thing, I think, in public-private partnerships, I, I think that there's just a, a lot to be learned there. Uh, because, you know, again, I think we, a lot of what we often forget is that most of our most powerful industries, uh, the internet, for example, a lot of areas in automobile, a lot of areas in biotechnology, were developed by government, uh, invest, government investment. Uh, and so I think that this kind of notion that the government plays some nefarious role in investment or, or in, in any kind of control over the economy misses how important it is for the development of new energies or new, new industries. And I think we see this with the, the energy sector, the renewable energy sector that's, that's playing out right now. Now, the interesting thing, kind of skipping back over to China for a few minutes, if we are looking out across the Pacific and figuring out uh, how frightened are we and what can we learn, um, I do think it's important to just keep in mind um, how dramatically successful China's economic, economic system has been, while at the same time understanding that in my view, the last year has been a little bit of a frightening one. Um, and it's been a little bit of a puzzle for me to try to figure out why over the course of the last year. But every time I go to China, I, every time feels a little bit more uncertain. Uh, and I was trying to figure out why because, you know, Wen Jiabao and Hu Jintao have been in power for almost a decade now. Uh, and so it shouldn't have been that sudden that it feels that bad. Um, but one of the things I realized is that I'm a huge Zhu Rongji acolyte. I actually believe that so much of what China has done over the course of the 1990s and the momentum that carried through to the early 2000s and mid 2000s was really because of the economic policies of Zhu Rongji. And I think that so much of the stability that was set in place and so much of the momentum about creating a rational economic system really came under his watch. And I think Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao the current administration don't know what they're doing that much. And I think even more than not knowing what they're doing that much, they are not trusted by the localities. And so you see the localities kind of doing their own thing more and more. And I think that this is a very dangerous state. Now, of course, right now, we're in the middle of this transition to the next generation of leaders. Um, and just in the middle of that transition, we have this unbelievable crisis that's going on with Bo Xilak. Uh, this crisis just keeps getting deeper and deeper, and it's just an unbelievable script that is playing out right now. The thing that was so interesting to me about the Boshi Lai is that it really is clear that I think that the current administration fears a new strongman. That, remember, there's a lot of history for in China, right? There's not just the history of Deng Xiaoping who arose outside of the political system, but Mao Zedong himself. 
Uh, and so I think that there's been this, just this fascinating thing to watch that China is still evolving politically. And as, as bullish as I've been about how stable it is as a, as an act, as a political economy, um, I'm less certain today than, than I've been in a long time. And so I think it's going to be a very interesting couple of months and um, a uh, year or so to see how this all plays out over the course of the next decade or so. Um, so those are my thoughts. Now, that hopefully is, uh, segues well into, into a, an insightful discussion about uh, the future of China's economic growth, which I think we all know is a future of both the politics and economics. And it's such a great pleasure to have a, a, an economist, a political economist, uh, come in and talk about um, what it is that we need to be thinking about with these issues. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Danny Leitzler, to, uh, to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much Doug, for setting the stage for us, and uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our guest speaker, uh, Professor Dwight Perkins of Harvard. Uh, Professor Perkins, for anyone who's worked on East Asia, you uh, read one or more of his books. He worked on Korea, he did the seminal work in 1980 on the modernization of uh, the Korean state. Uh, if you read about China, you'll have read his uh, mid-80s book. Uh, but uh, contrary to a lot of uh, professors uh, who, uh, who, who stop working at a certain stage, uh, he's just come back from Myanmar, uh, he's been in Cuba, he continues to be extremely active. Uh, so Professor Perkins is the Harold Hitchens Burbank Research Professor. He's had that chair for uh, a while. Before that, he ran HID, ran Harvard's uh, Asia <coughs> Center. So we've asked him to uh, speak for uh, not more than a half an hour. Then we have two discussants from GW, uh, Professor Yang from the International Business Department, Shahid Yusuf from the Growth Dialogue, uh, my colleague in this uh, project here. Uh, and then there'll be time for questions. And to entice you to stay till the very end, there will be wine and cheese afterwards. Um, so Professor Perkins, the floor is yours. Thank you, Danny. Uh, they don't put clocks in the uh, GW room, so that I have to try to read this with my failing eyesight. Um, what I'm going to um, do uh, this afternoon is my charge is to sort of look at what's going to happen to the economy and what the implications of that are for, for a variety of issues that China is going to face going forward. So I'm not going to go back and review how China got here and talk about what a magnificent growth performance China's had over all these years. I'm assuming you, you know all about that. So what I'm going to, I'm going to first do is present a fairly elaborate argument about why China is going to slow down and why it's going to slow down soon, not, uh, not 20 years from now. If China were to keep on going like what it's doing right now, and, or what it, particularly what's done over the last decade or so, and go on 20, 30 years ahead, uh, both in terms of GDP and in terms of trade, you, you get these enormous numbers. China's GDP today is, in US dollars, an exchange rate calculation, $7 trillion or so. You double that every seven years, you know, 14, 28, 56 trillion dollars uh, in a matter of, uh, uh, of uh, about three decades. That's not going to happen. It may happen someday, but it's not going to happen in three decades. Foreign trade the same way. You end up, uh, you end up getting figures that suggest all of the trade of the world is going to be exporting and importing from China. I'm going to try to present an argument of why that's you know, what you're going to see instead over the next few years is not a failure of the economy. It is, in fact, a normal process of economic growth. China has managed to su sustain growth by, you know, you could call them artificial, artificial means, but they've actually met real needs by sustaining growth 
with massive government investment. I'm going to try to uh, describe how that has worked. But I'm going to say that whole period is going to come to, is coming to an end. It isn't at an end, but it's going to be coming to an end over the next if three years, five years, I would say at most seven or eight years. Uh, I have to meet with a senior U.S. government person tomorrow morning, and he will only be concerned with what's happening over the next four years, or maybe the next 12 year, 12 months. Uh, I can't get more. I can't get precise enough for that. But for the sometime in the fairly near future, things are going to change. And then the question then is what can keep it going for a little while longer? What is it that China is going to have to do even to keep it going at all? And then I'm going to end with just a very brief remark on what the, the issue that really the dean raised uh, in his, uh, uh, in his, uh, in his, toward the end of his remarks. Uh, what, is, what are all the implications of this for Chinese politics? Uh, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go at length into it, but the implications of a slowdown in growth are, for Chinese politics are, are profound. Uh, it means China has a fundamentally different political uh, context going forward, and the, how they respond to it is going to determine whether this is a scary time or whether it's a, a uh, uh, not a, not such a, whether it's going to be onward to better and better society and so on. First point. China's growth now has grown longer and faster uh, than any other country. Uh, this is China's per capita growth. You add a point to it if you want the total GDP growth. For three decades, it's grown at, at nearly 9% a year per capita. That means it's doubled every, uh, every eight years. By the way, if you if you want to impress your friends and you don't know how to do this, you, the way you know how long it takes to double is you divide the number into 72. And, and you, can, you can, seven divided into 72 is 10 years, eight into 72 is nine. You can impress your friends at cocktail parties, uh, what, how brilliant a mind, mathematical mind you have. Um, but the point is that this is, this is funny. I and mean, you look at, for example, Japan, Two, two decades of that kind of growth. Now they, uh, yeah, and Korea, four decades, but slower growth. And then as you go down to Southeast Asia, you have periods of decent growth, but no, nothing so sustained. Uh, Taiwan, more like Korea, uh, Hong Kong. Hong. Now, so the, the first thing that gives you some sense that you know, makes you wonder, is this going to come to an end? Is simply, this is an extraordinary performance for a long period of time. Is there something unusual about China that can keep going for another uh, two or three decades? And my answer will be no. Now, one of the reasons it's gone as long as it has is because China started this process at a lower per capita income. China, in 1961, had uh, a per capita income of about $700. In 1978, when the reform process started, it wasn't much higher than that. A little bit higher, but not much. Uh, as contrasted, for, to example, for Korea, $1,800 in 1961. 61 is when the Korean boom started. Uh, and Taiwan, also $1,900 which in 1961, which is when the Taiwan boom started. Uh, Japan, uh, you have to go back much, much earlier, but Japan was even richer at the time. Uh, it finally recovered from the uh, devastation of, of World War II in 1955, and then took off for another uh, roughly uh, two decades, Hong Kong uh, richer. So, uh, so part of the reason is simply, this is catch-up growth. That's, this is not, a, in a sense, a completely new model of how growth. Catch-up growth is when you can learn fairly readily from one of, the, of the people that went ahead of you. Everybody's doing, every other country except England did, did catch-up. England was the one that led the, led the way. Everyone else was playing catch-up. But the ones that came much later were able to grow much more rapidly. 
in fact, the reason Japan could grow as rapidly as it did, even though it started its growth back in 1900, is that, of course, had that long period uh, uh, during where World War II destroyed the economy, and it took a long time to rebuild, and then it, then it caught up to where it would have been, would have been otherwise. Now, the question, though, is, all right, is there anything we can say about when this is likely to happen? And when I first sort of looked at this, which is uh, oh, five or six years ago, doing some work that I'll talk about in a moment about uh, what are the sources of Chinese growth, uh, I, uh, I was fooling with the data and I noticed that Japan, Taiwan, and Korea all slowed down in a major way at exactly the same per capita income. It was about $13,000 per capita in purchasing power parity uh, terms. These are all purchasing power parity dollars, not exchange rate dollars. And the uh, and in 2000 prices, 13,000, all three of them uh, had a sharp drop. And when we were doing this book on Korea that will be coming out in a few months, my co-authors and I decided, well, if it works for those three, does it work, work for everybody else? And the answer is, yeah, it does, sort of. Uh, this is where all of the countries that reached sort of $20,000 per capita slowed down. Oops. Uh, and as you'll see, that most of them are between $10,000 and $16,000 per capita. The outliers, frankly, are not very interesting. I mean, one of them I know is, is Norway, which had uh, discovered off, you know, it's a tough, first of all, it's a tiny country. Two, it, it has the huge North Sea oil finds. Another was uh, Britain under Margaret Thatcher, uh, accelerated growth at a higher income, uh, and then fell off. Uh, but basically, something happens uh, you know, $16,000 purchasing power parity per capita is a long way from catching up with the richest countries. They're up at $40,000, $45,000 dollars per capita. Uh, what is happening is something goes on at this, uh, in this period that, uh, that essentially you can't catch up any, you can't just play catch up anymore. You've got to start doing your own thing. And that means you become more dependent, for example, on research and development. And the essence of research and development is that you make a lot of mistakes. As long as you can sort of copy what other, not, not copy, but adopt what other people have done to your circumstances, and you have a general path as to what industries to develop, uh, how to go about developing them, and so on, you can go at a really fast clip for a while, for essentially, uh, well, my two friends here who are World Bank types, as long as you do everything the World Bank says you should be doing, you can go real, at least when they get it right, sometimes when they don't, but anyway, never mind. Uh, the, uh, you're, you can, you're going to have that catch-up period, but that catch-up period is going to come to an end, and it's going to come to an end a lot sooner than when you actually catch up to the per capita income of the rich countries. I've had, uh, in the work I've been doing with Korea, I've had one of our co-authors, you know, when I presented this argument about, about in this case, about Korea rather than China, he said, that can't be true. I'll, I'll, we'll never, I'm never going to catch up. My standard of living is never going to be up to catch up with that of the U.S. and so on. I'll be too old. Well, you know, that, uh, that unfortunately is true. It takes longer. Uh, he, uh, he's actually done fine, but uh, uh, the, pres the, two pres pre the current president of Korea, the current president of, of Taiwan, <laughs> both ran on platforms that the slow growth was a temporary thing and that they were, not going, they were going to get the growth back up to 7 or 8% a year. The reality is they haven't come close and they can't come close. So there's something going on here. Then the question, well, here. Then the question is what? Well, in a half hour, there are a lot of issues, and some of which I can't. Uh, the basic point about the 
first phase, these last three decades of growth uh, in, in China, is that on the supply side, much of the growth, what really separated out China's very high performance from its very poor performance before 1978, is enormous jump in productivity. Now, the jump in productivity also made higher rate of investment possible, and capital played an important part of the story. But the rate of investment in 19, in the early 70s, was essentially the same as it was in the early 80s. But the rate of growth more than doubled. And essentially what happens is a tremendous jump in productivity. I'm not going to take you through the, through the data. Uh, and that jump in productivity came about largely through dismantling the old Soviet-type system that China had. It went back to household agriculture. You did a whole bunch of other things. Um, and in fact, uh, Dean Guthrie's remarks about Zhu Rongji, what he did in the 1990s to, uh, to reform the state enterprises was a big part of that. When he came to, 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 Secret to uh, President Clinton and Rubin and said, you know, even though we, for the last 10 or 15 years we've refused to, uh, uh, you know, to, we've been negotiating very hard on our membership in the WTO, and we wanted to be treated like a developing country. We wanted all these exceptions. You know, we've changed. We're we're going to we we're going to accept the American terms almost in their entirety. Clinton and Rubin, you know, were taken aback, but they sort of they sort of uh, dilly dallied and said something to the effect, "Well, well." That's nice, but uh, it, politically it's going to be diff too difficult for us. Zhu Rongji went out to Denver, gave a speech to a few hundred businessmen. The businessmen, and he laid out exactly what he told Clinton and Rubin. And, uh, and the businessmen got on the phone and said, are you crazy? This is the best deal you're ever going to get. Uh, how can you possibly not accept this? And, you know, and, and actually by the time Zhu Rongji got back to Boston and then went up to Canada, uh, they, Clinton and Rubin had changed their position and began, negotiations began. China joined the WTO. The reason for joining the WTO was first and foremost to get control of the state enterprises, force them to compete. And, and, that, uh, and that's part of this productivity story. But if you, uh, on the supply side, if you're going forward, if you're going to basically talk about, OK, you're going forward into, into, into the future. What is it that you can, uh, what is it they have to do in that regard in terms of productivity going forward? And it turns out that because the labor force is no longer growing, so that source of growth is largely going, there is still some ability to transfer low productivity labor from the countryside into the city. But most of the people who can be easily transferred have already moved. Surveys show that of the 18 to 40 year olds, the ones that can most readily move, almost all of them are out of agriculture. They're all in the cities. The families are back home, but the, but the, and the grandparents are taking care of the kids. But uh, uh, they have largely moved. So that's bringing the, that brings the growth rate. The labor force increase can't bring growth down. I'll show in a bit why the investment rate can't keep going up. Uh, and so essentially, you've got to have a higher rate of productivity, uh, even though it's going to be harder to get high productivity growth going forward than it has been in the past. So whereas the best you could do in terms, and I'll use technical terms, if, you, if those of you who know economics follow it, those of you who don't, it doesn't matter. Uh, the total factor of productivity in the past, has, the highest it's been is about 3% a year. In the going forward, if they were to continue to achieve 9%, 8 9% growth, they'd have to have 4% productivity during uh, uh, starting fairly soon. That doesn't seem very realistic. There's no obvious way. I mean, if they're doing their own R&D, they aren't going to get that kind of productivity growth. No one in history ever has. There's no reason to think China has. Well, that, so on the supply side, production side, if you like, there's reason to think that 
growth is going to come down. But it's sort of in some ways easier to understand that it's a, it's a clear problem if you look on the demand side. And this is China's breakdown of GDP on the expenditure side. And what you have is, is uh, total consumption, which includes government consumption, household consumption, the red line, and then investment coming up to nearly 50% of GDP, an extraordinary figure, and then the net trade balance. Essentially, these are the sources of demand in the, in the Chinese society. Now, the figure that where I start this analysis, and it's taken me a few, actually two or three years to begin to figure out, or at least I think I've begun to figure out what's going on. The really extraordinary figure is this per capita, uh, is this uh, share of household consumption in GDP. In the, in the US, it's 70%. In most countries, it's around 60. In China, at the beginning of the reform period, it starts at around 50. And then in, in, in over these recent couple of decades, it's fallen to around 33, 34% of GDP. This is an extraordinarily low figure. Now, there are those who argue that they, these data aren't any good. And in fact, just before I first went in to make a presentation of this in China to a whole pile of government officials and others, a few, three, two or three years ago, the, a friend of mine who, have, who is currently deputy governor of the central bank said all those figures are no good anyway. So when I had to open up my remark. That sort of shook me up a little bit. And I had to open up my remarks saying that if my figures are off by more than 20%, you can disregard everything I'm about to say. Uh, but if they're within that margin, it's at least, uh, I think, what I'm about to say is valid. Now, so this, this sharp drop in, uh, in, uh, in household consumption. Why is that so important? Well, when you have only 33, 34% of GDP demanded by households, you've got to find 66, 67% of GDP to be demanded by somebody else. Well, the government provides a, about 14% or so. For a while, there was a belief that China could, uh, you know, people, China was going to get a lot of demand simply by exporting goods without importing. That is, net exports were going to get bigger and bigger. And in fact, they did reach a peak at around 8 or 9% of GDP. But that, that came to an end. China can't keep pushing exports at the rate it's been doing. And furthermore, it doesn't make sense to, to keep on building up reserves. China has over $3 trillion in reserves now. I mean, essentially what we're doing in the United States is we're getting all these goods from China and we're giving them pictures of George Washington. Uh, actually, there aren't pictures of George Washington on Treasury bills, but, uh, but it's the same basic idea, giving them dollar bills. If we could continue that deal, we could uh, live a life of leisure. Now, so then the question is, OK, well, how, what is it uh, that, uh, that one, uh, how do you fill that gap? This is just a way of showing with a comparison with other East Asian countries. Uh, or what, in this case, I'm sorry, this is a chart with Latin America, Caribbean. As you can see, most of the countries are 60% up to nearly 70% China falling off, falling off uh, the chart. Uh, so this is not a normal thing. This is a very abnormal structure uh, for the economy. Now, the, what ha has effectively happened is that the only way to fill this gap has been to raise investment. Keep on going. So you, oops, you get the investment rising almost to 50% of GDP. Uh, in 2010, it's still up there. In 2011, the expenditure data haven't been, I haven't been able to find the one for 2011 yet. The statistical books don't come out for another, uh, another month. Now, the question then becomes, 
how can you spend that much money on investment? It's not going to be producing consumers for, the, for your population. You can do that with 20% of GDP. Probably less, but certainly no more than 20 That's even if you're very inefficient. As to provide 30 to the 33% of, of GDP that's consumption requires an investment of 15, 20%, something. You do your own, you can make assumptions and get slightly different results. Now, what, what do you do with the other? How do you get so much more? Well, in China, the answer is you, they got it over the last years by two things. They got it through a massive housing and building program and through a massive infrastructure program. And these housing and building programs are really quite extraordinary. Uh, the, the housing program, I, and I need to read the figures so that I get them, get them correct. China, between 2005 and 2010, six years, built 7.6 billion square meters, or 76 billion square feet of housing. Well, that sounds like a big figure, but what does it mean? It means something like 700,000 apartment buildings of 100,000 square feet. That's that's a good sized apartment building with a hundred one and two bedroom apartments. 700,000 in six years. For China, for what is a fairly decent, apart, good apartment for China, 80 square meters or 800 square feet, that's enough for something like 200 and, and uh, 284, 85 million people in six years. So you have this tremendous expansion in housing. Architects are all going to China. My brother goes to China now. He has a big architectural firm in Manhattan. He goes to China now far more than I do. He goes 10 times a year. Every time he turns around, there's, there's more work to do. The, and, that, and most of the work isn't done by foreign architects, most of it by domestic, but there's still a lot left over. So, you know, 280, 90, 85 million people. Then you have on top of that, you have another uh, 5 billion square, square meters of, of office space. So you have this tremendous amount of, uh, this tremendous amount of construction going on. It is a level of construction that quite frankly cannot be sustained. At least it cannot be sustained in any, as a rational act. Uh, as within 20 some years, you can totally replace the entire stock of housing in the urban areas. This doesn't even count rural housing. This is just urban housing. So, so, and I think what you're seeing now is in fact the real estate prices are soft, they're coming down, there's a real uh, a problem going forward. So that doesn't mean housing is going to stop. But it means that this notion of doing 1.5 billion uh, meters of uh, housing every year is, is going to come down. So that's one source. You're not going to get the big demand from that. I'll talk about where you will get demand in construction in a moment. Then you look at uh, how many of you have any, how many of you have been in China? Lots of you, good. Okay. The highway system. And when I first went to, I mean, I first went to Asia in 61, but when I first went to, when the, when the Chinese would give me a visa and the US government wouldn't seize my passport, if, if I went to China, it was the first time it was in 1974, 75, I traveled all through the countryside. You know, the, the, the main trunk highways were two lane and were, they were paved. Everything else was gravel and dirt, uh, almost no paved roads and certainly nothing wider than except for uh, in Beijing, uh, Chang'an Boulevard is wide. It was wide even then, but, but you know, the rest of it. Now, you know, this magnificent interprovince or interstate highway system, comparable to ours, 
only it's brand new. And it, 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 it's everywhere. Uh, you, go, uh, you go out into, I was in Qinghai a couple of years ago, one of the western provinces, one of the poorer provinces. Uh, again, the highways go, they don't go all the way to Tibet, but they go well into the populated, through the populated areas of Qinghai and so on. So, so you built a, a wonderful uh, interstate system. Airports. Well, everybody knows Beijing and, and Fudong Airport in Shanghai and Hongqiao Airport in Shanghai and so on. But they, every single provincial capital has a big, fancy, brand new provincial airport. And China has now announced that it's going to build 43 more new airports. The um, one area where there's still things to do is the high speed rail. China's going to have four high speed rail east west and four north south, you know, 250 miles an hour, maybe, or the, yeah, uh, three, hot. 300 if they want to have more accidents. Uh, you know, that isn't finished, but a big chunk of it is finished. In another four, five, six years, that's going to be finished. They're spending over $100 billion a year on that. And one, and one can continue on uh, in, in, that re in that respect. Every time I think they can't come up with a new idea for expenditure, they do. Uh, so ch the Chinese leader's imagination is considerably better than mine. Uh, so when I thought they'd run out of, began to run out of ideas, they came up with the idea, well, of course, you know, we have a terrible water problem in North China, so we're going to move the Yangtze River water north uh, into uh, China, and that's, you know, uh, another 30, 40, 50 billion dollars. And that, of course, now is already well along and done. Now, the, you know, there are two things, though, that are related to this. Over time, you begin to run out of these ideas. Even with more imagination than I have, you're just, you know, there's a limit to how many of these fancy highways you can productively invest in. The rate of return on this investment, a lot of it, has clearly got to fall. The other thing is the recurrent cost, that is the maintenance of these facilities, is going to take off. If it doesn't take off, then they're going to fall apart 10 years from now. But if it does take off, it's going to cut way into uh, net, you know, it'll cut into the productive investment. It'll be replacement investment, if you like. Uh, so it'll be part of gross investment, but net investment uh, would fall. Now, then, the, so the question really is: Is there are there still a lot of things that China could do? In a sense, China is doing something very similar to what Japan and Korea did in Korea, when they had to rebuild after the war. In the case of Japan, the US just totally destroyed every single city of Japan except Nara and Kyoto. They burned it to the ground, burnt them all to the ground, literally. Well, so that left a lot to rebuild. So Japan also had this boom. Korea, the same thing. The Korean War totally flattened everything. You ever see pictures of Seoul after it had been in, moved after the Chinese and American troops had moved back and forth across it three, three times or whatever it was? Uh, Seoul is just rough, and much of the rest of the Korean city is the same. So there was an enormous amount of investment that they made, and their investment rate goes up, not as high as 50% of the GDP, but it goes up. So, so there, there clearly was a need in China's case. In China's case, it wasn't because of war. It was because of a Soviet-type strategy that said no money to be spent on housing, no money to be spent on transport. That was the Soviet. You know, the only time you invested in transport in the Soviet system was after the system got so overloaded that it began to really break down. Then the Soviet Union would invest. China basically was following a strategy like that. Housing was something they also ignored until after 1978. And then they began to fill this gap, and they filled it with a vengeance. Now, but that is that period is coming to an end. Is there anything left to uh, uh, I should get through this very quickly, I guess. I'm, when did I start? You know? 
anyway. Uh, the, the question uh, then is, what can they do going forward? Well, there's still things that have to be done that have been done. One obvious one is, is environmental cleanup. It's an enormous task here. How big it is in money terms, I've never seen a completely uh, a figure that anybody has done that really tells you how much a full cleanup of the environment would cost. I'd love to see such a figure. The ones, the figures I have seen are really quite small. The, there's still a need for housing. The need for housing is primarily for uh, the rural migration, migrant population. Essentially, nothing has been done for them until very recently. And to give you some idea, people talk about, oh, China doesn't have slums. But China has plenty of slums. You just can't see them. Uh, there's, a, there's one authorized school for migrants, children, in the southern part of uh, Beijing. And it's uh, called the Dandelion School in English. Uh, it, all the students are children of migrants. When they first set up the school, the idea was they would just take students from around the area that could walk to school and get back home at night. But they quickly discovered that if the students went home at night, they couldn't study. Because they were jammed into a room with five or six other people even without a television set, that was absolutely impossible to study. So the school decided that the only way they could deal with this problem was that they would have all the students stay at the school Monday through Friday and then go home on the weekend. Well, that gives you some idea of the housing. I mean, you, you, know, you have eight people to a room and so on. You have people living in air raid shelters. You have people living on construction sites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's why most, a large number of the migrants leave their children back home. So, so there's something to build. And in fact, uh, the figure is you know, two or three trillion yuan or $500 billion a year would, make, would probably be needed to fill this need. And, and that over, over, over a period of, of 10 or 15 years. But that doesn't begin to fill uh, this, this gap in, in investment that, that I talked about. Now, so there are, there are things to do, but, the, but it, it's unlikely that they're going to be the highly productive investments that one has seen over the past two or three decades. So then uh, the question is, uh, what else happens besides uh, those things? And you know, there will be an increase in the share of research and development, R&D. There's a, a need for a lot of things that don't cost money. Improvement in the legal system, for example. But even expanding of R&D, the pr principal constraint is probably not uh, the money. They could put a lot of money into R&D, but you've got to have the people. And it takes much longer to, dis to, to develop the really, and there are limits on the number of first class scholars, first class uh, you know, researchers in science and engineering and so on that you can produce in this way. So going forward, China has a huge issue of how to fill this gap. They can fill it artificially by, uh, by massive investment in things that are of low productivity, including houses that nobody lives in and things of this sort. And there is a certain amount of that going on. But that won't keep growth up for very long. So, so the basic point here is growth is going to come down. And when growth comes down, the fundamental basis on which the Chinese Communist Party has basically sold itself to the people of China is, uh, is through this high growth. And the question is, going forward, how are they going to keep a stable political context in China with a much slower growth rate? And the answer is, I don't have the, I don't know. That's a very unsatisfactory answer. But I'm saying, they, China somehow has to begin to seriously get involved in thinking about how to get the population of the country more involved in the decision making of the society, whether it's through elections or through some other process than they have to date. 
They've done a very good job so far of co-opting the, the educated elite and, the, and then keeping everybody else happy. You know, these farmers that live, uh, these migrants that live in these eight people to a room are not, the, are not discontented particularly. They don't like the conditions, but they're better off than they were when they were forced to stay in the countryside. So in a sense, you know, right now things, uh, we were talking at just a little bit earlier, I mean, there's clearly beginning to be a lot of unhappiness, and you see it with the Boshi Lai situation, uh, people talking about corruption more overtly. The corruption has been there now for a long time, but the, 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 the level at which the blogs in China are going after people and talking about it, and the fact that everybody knows whose relatives are uh, get enormous amounts of money, and uh, we have a student at Harvard who is the son of Bo Lai who drives his Porsche and apparently took the, as you probably read in the paper, he took the daughter of John Huntsman out uh, in his Ferrari, oh, that was in Beijing. Uh, you know, that sort of thing uh, doesn't go over well in a country where most people are earning a few thousand dollars a year. Yeah. But they were, I think most people were willing to live with it as long as the, everything was booming. If things come down, not to a halt, but come down to five or six percent, I think the challenge, the political challenge, is going to get more and more severe, and it'll be up to the Chinese leadership to either figure out how to deal with it or not, in which case we will, we will all suffer probably. But uh, on that uh, cheerful note, I will stop, and it's time for the discussions to come. Uh, and you can explain why my calculations are wrong. Thank <laughs> you.